you've been hearing a lot about voice technology, artificial intelligence, and how it's the next big thing, but you're not quite sure what that means for you, you're not the only one. Whether you're a developer trying to create a conversational interface, a business that wants to know what this means for the future of commerce, or just a human being wondering why in the world we need more robots when we're trying so hard just to connect to each other, you've come to the right place. Hey Sachet, how's it going? Not too bad, how about you? I'm so glad you're here. Glad to be here. Seriously though, you've been doing this for quite a while. It's definitely different and it's fairly new. I'm Nandini, and welcome to this new video series where we'll explore all things related to voice tech and the rich elements of human communication that will be the key to its success. Hey Google, let's talk to Number Genie. I'm thinking of a number from zero to 100. We're looking for great apps out there to highlight how you're using these elements to create your own conversational experience. What you're building is a conversation. What was the biggest challenge for you? You realize you have so many options. How do you maintain that variability? So there's a lot of opportunity here actually for the developer to be clever. Because cats rule the internet. <laughs> right. So let's talk. It's kind of where we're starting today is hello world. I'm Nandini, and I enable conversations between humans, among businesses, and any combination in between, some of which includes some machines. Um, who's excited about this series, developers? We just launched this as a teaser on YouTube, but it's coming, and you're going to hear all about that today. But I want you to stop and take a moment, take a picture in your mind right now of why voice is interesting. Why is it? I wonder what you're thinking. We're living in a time when innovation is shifting our outlook so rapidly of our future. In fact, it's so rapid that it's worth taking that moment to stop and think about where you are now and how different it could be in a week's time a month's time, and next year I guarantee you will be a different landscape, a different ecosystem than we are today. You're part of that, by the way. <laughs> so why is that? Enabling machines to speak on our behalf, to speak to us out loud, is so deep to our context as a culture and as to human beings, it makes us question where we are. It makes us question where we are with technology. It really is putting us at the intersection of technology and the human condition. More than ever before, we're actually confronting a reckoning between science and culture right now. So I have a lot more to say about that topic, but today's not the forum for that. Um, today, we're just starting a conversation. And the hardest part about any conversation is listening. So we want you to know, developers, designers, businesses, we've heard you. We've seen the feedback from I.O. and conferences like this that the most valuable part of the experience is interacting with Googlers and with other developers and people creating experiences out there. So we decided to create a different kind of content feedback loop for you and with this series. So, in our first few episodes, for example, we're going to start by helping you understand just how to get your arms around the 0D interface, and then how you supplement that with other elements like visuals. Um, we'll show you what palette you have to work with, how to create your landscape, how to build your world for your users in your own unique way. So in our first season, we just wrapped filming. It's very exciting. We're going to have six episodes we've already filmed. Um, we're going to have things like greetings and goodbyes. How do you start and end a conversation? Including, how do you do re-engagement? How do you identify users? How do you authenticate them? And how do you make money at this? Transactions are a big part of this. Um, we'll also show you how to create custom voices to brand your experience. Um, how to create character, what does it take to create character and persona? And also, what are sounds involved in all this? There's audio landscaping you can create that's an entirely new world that will be the gateway to things like virtual reality technology. So from there, we'll explore timely topics and deeper concepts 
and feature and highlight examples from the ecosystem. We want to showcase what good looks like. What are you guys creating out there? And what kinds of people it takes to make this work? So, well, and, and then on each episode, we'll always feature guests um, that will help us dig a little deeper. And they will be people from the community. Sometimes they'll be Googlers. And come on up, you guys. So we're going to do a little live show today um, to talk a little bit about what this means and hopefully get a little bit of insight. And, and we'll actually not answer all your questions. But we have a few questions that I've gathered from social media and just from our advocacy work that we've done in this space. So to start out, I want to introduce our panel. You know, I'm thrilled to have this great uh, set of panelists here that um, I personally selected because I feel like they're most representative of where people who have come at this and pivoted um, to this field from other areas uh, to give us some insight into their journey of how they got here. Because I really think that there are a lot of experts in the field, but actually very few that are considered experts, but there's this kind of tapped in muscle that you don't really even realize you have that you can design and build for this space. And that's what I'm hoping you'll get out of this today and the whole series. So we'll start by first, we have Mark Paulina, um, who together with Peter Hodgson in the audience, they've created a new rapid prototyping uh, technique that involves, you know, it's a methodology for interaction design. And in fact, to give you an idea how we're really taking the audience and with, you know, building the series with the audience and our users in mind and our viewers in mind, we built this panel also directly from feedback from you guys. So for example, Mark just ran a sprint with uh, Peter with a small group across the street uh, with this new methodology, but it has to be done in a small scale. So we want to scale that big. So we're going to show it on camera so that you can all learn from it. That's an example. Um, another is, is Kimberly Harvey who has pivoted with deep research experience, um, recently pivoted to design. She'll tell you about that. Um, but Kimberly on the panel is a direct request from um, the GDE community. Yes, Shuli. Shuli from the Tel Aviv area, a UX research expert in children's research, um, asked about having more representative uh, from UX research. And Kimberly su offers such a great point of view for that. So she's here. And then finally, if you don't already know him, Sachit, he has found the decoder ring between design and engineering. And I can credit Sachit as fully responsible, him and his team, for pulling me out of my shell of where I was working and doing more advocacy work. So thank you. And um, also, another example is um, the G Plus community, I'd ask, what, do you, what else do you want to see in our videos? And the immediate answer was authentication, transactions, how do we do those? And so we reached out to David Wang, who's going to be on one of our very first episodes talking about that, who's from the product management team. So this team are all advocates for you, and we're really excited to dig into some questions. So welcome, everybody. Thank you. Okay. So, um, Sachit, let's start with you. Voice, what's all the noise about? Sure. Uh, first off, Nandini, thank you for having me on the panel, and thanks to all of you for coming. It's really exciting, actually, to be here. Uh, just, Nandini gave me a great introduction, but just to add to it a little bit, I'm an engineer at Google working mostly on developer tooling, and I was working on the living room team before uh, on sort of Android TV and cast, and Google Home became part of the living room, so that's how I got it. It's kind of sucked into this, thank God. And uh, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, about a year ago, Nandini and I were working on some of the first uh, samples, um, which, by the way, she helped. It's, if you ever have the chance to have her help with an app you're building, she has an extraordinary talent for both the design and the technical portion. And Please she'll really continue. help the code you write. Um, seriously, she saved me a lot of time, trust me. In any case, uh, to, to get back to your question, Nandini, about um, what's all this noise about, I think that this noise that we're, that we're hearing is the low, low hum of the sci-fi promise, to take words directly from Nandini. And what I mean by that is we are at the very, very, very early stages of the next mode of interaction between us and machines. And this is something we've dreamt about for decades, and it's finally happening. And so far, it's, 
it's still a little rough, right? A lot of these interactions are still a little uh, frustrating sometimes. But what's important is to listen through the noise for the signal of those magical moments that we have with machines. And it's happening today. And we're going to be telling you know, future generations about these days, years from now, when it's working as they expect it to. Great. Thanks, Sachit. Um, so how about you, Kimberly? What's all the noise about? <laughs> um, God, um, so I guess noise meaning what's exciting about voice. Uh, for me, what is exciting about it is I feel like we're getting closer and closer to a direct thought download. I studied communication and cross-cultural communication in grad school, and um, you know, everyone knows humans have a lot of different methods of communicating. Someone might be watching this on video. I'm using gestures, I'm using words. Um, we have systems of writings all, all around the globe, but I feel like having um, having humans interact in a way that's been natural, that's been one of the first skills that we learned as babies, um, can kind of get rid of some of the challenges we have we're having, um, can get rid of some of the challenges we have getting one thought from one person's mind to another. Great. And Mark, you've been, des you've been a designer for a long time and you bring some unique perspectives on interaction design, but you, you started in voice actually but way before we had the Google Assistant. So um, how about you? What's all the noise about? Yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting time at the moment. Um, so, so talking about like, the journey that we've, been, we've had, um, I wasn't a voice designer before I started working on uh, voice actions in the Google Search app. I was an interaction designer working on mobile, working um, in automotive and TVs. But voice for me was, was quite a, um, a, a, a stunning journey. It was so different than what I was used to. So um, for me, it's been um, really um, enlightening thinking about voice and conversation and natural user interfaces and how there's such an emergence right now of all of these technologies like AI, Internet of Things, robotics, um, and so on, where the technologies are really trying to take the burden and the friction away from people. And so we've got all of this, these new natural user interfaces that um, set people's expectations so much higher than we've had before. So, so as a designer, it's been really exciting to um, try and create these new design methodologies where we can understand people um, a lot more um, and, uh, and try and meet users' expectations. As Sashi was saying, in the future, it should just work. But right now, with the technology, how it is, um, there's, there's a lot of really interesting design problems. Yeah. We've, what we've been seeing, and, and you know, that there is some kind of forgiveness there. People are at this point where they, they're like, OK, we get that it doesn't work perfectly all the time, and it's great to see that people are working on that, but it's like people get the possibility finally, which is um, so exciting. Um, well, let's, let's start. I have a few questions. I, I um, kind of pulled online, and then we have a few others that we got from just asking around at the conference. We do user-centered research. <laughs> Very not last minute at all. Um, so. This one comes from Twitter, uh, Bob Stoltzberg. Um, is the Google Assistant a Girl Scout? I can take this one. Yeah. Uh, well, the first thing I would ask Bob is, why do you think it's a Girl Scout? Um, what is it that lends itself to that stereotype that you have in your mind? That's just from a research perspective. But to answer his question, I would say that the assistant is not a Girl Scout, but it can facilitate relationships with characters like Girl Scouts. Um, we have an entire team at Google that just concerns itself with the personality, make sure that the interactions we're designing are on par with that personality, make sure the wording is right, and also uh, shows different parts of the assistant's character. That's great. And um, Ryan Germick, who heads the Doodle team and the personality team, has a great analogy that um, you ask personality questions, you sort of poke at things and ask at things that you can sort of ex know what to expect an answer from, or you know, a little, you know, like what color, do, what's your favorite color, things like that. And it's like when you establish, it's a way of establishing trust. So when you establish trust with your neighbor, for example, you might borrow a cup of sugar, uh, like Ryan says, borrow a cup of sugar before you go and ask for the lawnmower. So, uh, 
one of our episodes features how to write, like how do you write for personality questions that are just about the character you're interacting with, as opposed to the deeper uh, back and forth interaction about whatever that is the task you want to accomplish. So that's a great question. Um, and then, so we'll switch to a, oh, a zinger from the developer community. This one via LinkedIn, probably for Sachet, but maybe one of the others can pipe in. Um, so there's a common sentiment among developers who are leery of starting projects found in newer services and tools as they've been burned numerous times in the past by deprecation and abandonment of support. Um, so, given the inherent community-based nature of conversation design, can developers find assurances that Google recognizes this pillar and won't be abandoning support for the Assistant SDK, API.ai, the Speech Reco API, or other related projects to, this is amazing, allow innovators to create new products and even found businesses upon? Well, I will say one thing. If we were doing that, none of us have any jobs, so <laughs> <laughs> we're here. So d just to say that, but Sachit, from the developer perspective, you guys work with the tools and all the APIs and that, so um, what would you say to that? So first, I would, I would empathize with the person asking the question. Uh, it was I've Brandon Hunter, by the way, from LinkedIn, who asked amazing questions. Yeah. Thank you, Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, so I've felt that burn before, so I, I certainly wouldn't want to inflict that on, on anyone else. I would also uh, say in this space that I think a little bit extra uh, of an sort of adventurous attitude is actually called for here uh, from the developer's point of view because early investments now in terms of just picking up the knowledge around these APIs and around the, even the, just the terminology, just figuring out what the design looks like for these types of things will pay off uh, you know, exponentially in the future. But to directly answer the question uh, in terms of Google's investment in this space, I think it's very clear, just even using the list of uh, services and APIs that, that, that the uh, person asked in the, in the question, it's very clear that we're trying to push an entire suite of products on developers here. And I think that gives evidence to the idea that Google's really trying to push heavily into this space. And I can tell you from you know, sort of personal experience that, I mean, just in, internally, we are, we are seeing this as, as sort of the next step. And this also uh, is shown through the consumer side. So the Google Assistant, as an entire company initiative, it, it reflects the developer APIs and services that we're releasing. So I think what's, cl what's clear, if, if you look at the scope of what Google is actually putting out there, is that we see this really as the next step for both users and developers, and we will be supporting this moving forward. So I wouldn't worry too much about, um, about the sort of platforms going away or these services going away. Uh, even if there are changes and that kind of thing, clearly the, the platform as a whole, the, the conversational push as a whole isn't going anywhere and we're, we're sticking to that. Great, thank you. Okay, let's pivot to design. Um, Mark, can you talk about some of the design methods you've used to, um, for voice interaction? Sure, so as I said, um, Learning the design process for voice, um, being new to the, to the field is, is quite a challenge. Um, as I said, we can't use a lot of the same assumptions and the same design process and methodologies that we used for other experiences, for example, uh, designing apps, websites, and so on for, for voice. So um, it helps to um, keep learning new methodologies. So I personally take a lot from service design um, theory. Uh, one of the principles of service design is that we democratize the design process. So that means, for me, it means empowering the, the whole product team to be able to uh, come up with powerful experiences and come up with user-centered designs. And so the way to do that is um, just as a designer but, but, or a researcher um, or as, a, as, a, as anyone in the product team, just to be aware of um, who the user is and what the user needs and, be, and, and keep asking the question, what, what's the motivation, what's their goal, even what are their anxieties and their fears. Um, the more that you understand about the user, the more user-centered your designs are going to be. Like I said, people have got much higher expectations of these natural user interfaces than they have of other types of interface. Um, and then the other thing is um, best practices for conversation design. So, um, we, one principle we have for conversation design is that we focus a lot on designing for failure. Um, 
because with the, current, the technology how it currently is, there's a, there can be a lot of uh, misrecognitions, and also just with language, there's a lot of ambiguity. So we, we focus a lot, the, the happy path is quite, is fairly straightforward, but the unhappy path can be um, quite, quite complex. So we spend a lot of time focusing on designing for failure. Um, and then there's also investment in prototyping, so that's another um, aspect of user-centered design, is being able to validate what you're designing with users. Yeah. Sajit, you have a term for it instead of happy path. It's uh, yeah, I have something I call the happy tree. It's a happy is, tree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a Bob Ross reference in there somewhere. Um, happy little trees. <laughs> Um, okay, well, and then, I mean, you mentioned research, so Kimberly, um, so we can all talk, we can all speak or gesture, we can, we can all communicate. It's the first, it's the interface we learn first and the one we know best, so it's not like we need any help understanding that. Finding a button, so why do we need UX research? Why don't we need UX so, research? <laughs> um, just because we know how to speak doesn't mean we understand the intention of what's going on. For example, uh, uh, backstage I was saying, let's say Mark, Mark was outside in the center of the hall and I was talking to someone and I said, what does Mark look like? They would describe Mark in a certain way. Like, uh, he's wearing white shoes, he's got a multicolored shirt on, but if we were working in an office and Mark had been out with the flu for a week, and this was his first day back, and I turned to my boss and I said, what does Mark look like? My boss might say, well, he looks a little better than he did last week. Same question, completely different answers um, based on the context. And a lot of times while we are sitting and we're developing, even designing uh, an experience, we really don't know until we actually see it in motion, whether we've ironed out all of the kinks and um, whether there are surprising behaviors that are emerging from the designs that we didn't expect. So it's a great way to, um, it's almost like QAing your human condition to make sure that you've got everything covered. Mm. Cool. So Sachit, what about you? Um, I mean, you're learning other disciplines as you get into this, but just from a developer perspective, getting, you know, the, just the, the ramp up into this, like what can a developer bring from past platforms into this space? So I think the, the great thing about our platform in particular is it's mostly driven through the cloud and through the web. So what that means is uh, for developers who have already been developing on the cloud or like web apps or even APIs they've been building for mobile apps, that kind of thing, you'll be able to bring all that experience in. And the tools that we provide, like in particular API.ai, to abstract some of the harder uh, problems like the natural language understanding, those tools are fairly easy to use for, for anybody. You don't need a computer science degree, really, to understand that kind of stuff. So first, learning that is fairly simple. There's a low barrier to entry. And then secondly, with your existing cloud and web knowledge um, and just using basically efficient coding practices around things like string manipulation, uh, those kind of things, you can already build apps pretty effectively on our platform. And you know, one of the things I'm actually really looking forward to, hopefully, that I want to see from the community is more tooling and frameworks that we have similar to front-end apps uh, on other platforms like web apps and mobile apps. There's a lot out there if you just want to build a UI. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing how people build frameworks for building conversational UIs and voice UIs. I think that's going to be really exciting. Great. Um, and then usually once you start building, you're getting pretty, you're early in the process, you want to start prototyping. So Mark, you have some really unique perspective here. So do you have suggestions for how to prototype and voice interaction design? Yeah, I, I think prototype, uh, when I think about prototype, I'm looking at something that I can use early in the design process that I can, I can learn quickly and I can iterate really quickly. So um, I think it's really important that we invest in prototyping, um, especially if we don't have the years of experience um, working on voice user interfaces and that we're really learning on the go. So there's a few methodologies that we've used with, with some success, um, designing conversational UIs at Google, such as uh, Wizard of Oz um, prototyping. So this is the idea about Wizard of Oz is that you uh, remotely control uh, the device uh, that the participant is using in a study um, environment. Uh, but they think that they're speaking to the assistant, but really they're speaking to me as the puppet master putting it's the like strings behind the screen. You could like literally create the whole scene, like you could go yep. behind that, yeah. You could, you could basically <laughs> like emulate what they would believe is like the end user experience, but basically there's no AI, there's no cloud, yeah. it's just me on the other Cause, side. Because talking is as scrappy as it gets in terms yep. of, yeah, role playing, 
and it's, it's incredibly, like conversation is, uh, it can go anywhere, like you never really know, there's no set path. Um, and so to feel natural, you need to be able to pivot in real time. So, if, so really, unless you had the AI built for that, like the only person who can do that is, is a real person listening in real time. So Wizard of Oz is really powerful. Um, and you know, it can be s as simple as having a Bluetooth speaker and you know, the, the audio files um, ready to go on your laptop and you're just basically playing them as you're responding to the user. It takes a bit of practice, but it's really good. Um, uh, and then the other methodology that we use um, early in the design process is just saying out, out loud, role playing. Um, and in the Google Design Sprints, when we're actually um, got the whole product team uh, designing their conversations, we'll actually do investigative rehearsal, which is um, a methodology uh, created by Adam Lawrence of This Is Service Design doing. Uh, and it's basically the, the idea is that you can you rehearse the conversation in real time, and then you investigate that conversation, and you ask questions about it. So it's, it is the most scrappiest, most lowest fidelity prototype you, could, you can imagine, but incredibly powerful for um, sort of the, the first draft of the, of the conversation before you invest in any, in any, um, any uh, coded prototyping. It's funny you mentioned that you, for those sprints you were just talking about, that you have the whole product team there because you basically what you're facilitating is a conversation to build a conversation. <laughs> Uh, and it actually creates better conversations in terms of the actual apps, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's having the whole product team there, it kind of democratizes, as I said, the design process, that everyone shares the same understanding of, of the problem, everyone understands the user requirements, um, everyone understands uh, the, the, their goals and, and maybe the business goals as well, um, and, and everyone's thinking through that at the same time and, and trying stuff out. So it really is like a platform approach for design, um, yeah. which is pretty yeah. powerful. Yeah, in fact, that's probably a good place to close and just wrap up and, and is to get everyone thinking about, you know, this. Um, I've been doing this for a really, really long time. So hopefully, <laughs> if you feel like we raised more questions in this panel uh, than answers, then good, <laughs> because there's a lot to talk about. Um, as I start, uh, said at the beginning, this is just the start of a conversation, and there, it's like the inception of conversations. There's so many different kinds. There's worldwide conversations. There's conversations between one person and a group. There's two-person conversations. Um, this is just one of them, and it's a, it, it's a much larger one. So a conversation about the future of technology and, you know, where we are today and where we're going from here is going to take a new kind of ecosystem. This is called the conversation economy. You guys are part of it. And with your help, we need to build this new ecosystem. Um, we can actually, at this point, take a quantum leap past this AI first world. Um, in fact, you know, words really matter, right? Like, it's un actually quite unfortunate that we call it artificial at all when we need things like authentic and advanced intelligence more than ever. Um, we're all starving to amplify our own intelligence, so maybe amplified intelligence, you know, hashtag fix the glitch. Um, so we can, but you know, with all of your help, with the ecosystem of the developer community on all platforms, on all devices, it doesn't matter, users come first. And if we build a world using a people-first, creative approach to building solutions that people can use in their daily lives, it's more than just talking and getting answers anymore. People want insight and they actually want to be able to do things in their world. We want to find those micro moments that are assistive Oh, there's another A word. <laughs> um, and it, we just need the whole alphabet. <laughs> and we need, you know, all disciplines at the table, diverse voices, diverse approaches, diverse thinking. Um, this is really a time when, you know, it's like I said, the intersection of science and culture, human interaction, human solutions um, to a global problem of like, we built these machines, let's make them work um, on our behalf to help us connect more with each other in our world and the things we want to get done. So it's, I mean, personally, it's my, I mean, I've been doing this a long time working with this technology, but really it's my personal mission um, to give voice to others uh, and to help create a culture that we can build experiences that illustrate like a shared vision of our future. 
Um, we need to collectively recognize that good means, you know, going beyond, don't be evil or do what's right, to actually, you know, create experiences that are, you know, to show how it's done. And so hopefully with this series, we want to show what good looks like. We want partner experiences, developer experiences to showcase what you're creating and, in, you know, for your users. And, um, you know, for the common good of users everywhere. So, you know, we want to give insight um, to the kinds of um, people inside Google who are building this and also changing the landscape of the future of technology. Um, and also, you know, this is the power of spoken language and discourse. What kinds of people does it take out there in the ecosystem to change the landscape? You know, it's a disruptive environment. It's a really, really good thing. So we're all living our legacies in real time. You know, what are you going to be known for? What are you, what kind of world are you creating for your kids? Like, have that conversation with yourself and with each other, and we're going to create some amazing things, and I can't wait to see what you create, and we look forward to it. Thank you so much to our panel, and thank you to the audience for being part of this kind of exciting, creative moment for us. Thank you.